Well, good morning, friends. And welcome to the Congregational Church of Brookfield. Please know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, and we are delighted to have you all here with us in worship this morning. Let us take a few moments of silence to prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the tolling of our church bell. Please join me in this morning's call to worship. In the midst of a world where people hunger and thirst, let us worship a God who feeds the hungry. In the midst of a world where people are abused and oppressed, let us worship a God who calls for compassion and justice. In the midst of a world filled with wars and rumors of war, In the midst of a world where love is not freely shown and forgiveness is hard to find. Will you join with me now in our unison prayer of approach, which is printed in your bulletins? Let us pray. God, we come as we are this morning, distracted and weary, hopeful and open, knowing that you accept us and are ever mindful of all that lies beneath the surface. Forgive us for the ways that we allow voices other than yours to command our attention. Help us to center ourselves upon you, your voice, the ways in which you show us that you are present and active in our lives and the world, your call for us. Speak to us that we may be renewed in our faith and strengthened for your service. Following the example of your love made visible, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. children who would like to to come forward at this time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. All righty. We're almost all here. Okay. So today, by the way, Happy New Year. Has everybody been saying Happy New Year to you guys? Or you've been saying Happy New Year to people, right? Every year we do that. That's because the new year is a time when we look forward to like new experiences and new opportunities, new ways of growing, new things we can do. It's a time that many people use the new year as a time to think about things they want to do better, right? Things they want to stop doing that aren't good for them or things they want to start doing that are good for them, right? Well, I have two years right here, all right? This is my old year, and this is my new year. Now, I'm kind of old school. I put everything in my life down on paper, all right? I don't put it in my phone, because I don't know. That doesn't seem right to me. So let's look back at the old year. (laughs) I mean, I need to actually pick it up and look at it, right? Okay, so here's my old year. Some of those things are pretty simple, like stop and get milk. And some of those things are a little more important, like take time to pray or take time to just get closer to God, right? So uh, who can tell me some of the things that you would do to get closer to God? Any ideas? I mean, this is a new year, right? This is a new opportunity for us to think about that. How about take a little more time to pray, right? or to read the Bible, right? You probably read the Bible a little in Sunday school, but you could maybe pick up the Bible on a Wednesday, right, and read the Bible. Uh, Or how about memorizing one verse a month, right? Maybe just 12 verses. God says that he tells us to hide his words in our hearts so that we can do a better job of being the kind of people he wants us to be. So now let me show you this year. Pencil in all the things that I think are really important that I don't want to forget, that I, don't want, that I want to make sure I set aside time for, right? So you know what? It's important for me to make plans to get closer to God. And God has plans for us too. Because there's a verse in the Bible in Jeremiah 29, and it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I'm so glad that God has plans for our future, and he has plans for each one of you. But if we can make a plan to get closer to God, then we will be able to hear him when he speaks to our hearts and helps us know what his plans are for us. 
So if we can make that step to get closer to him, we will hear him and know how he wants to get closer to us and work in our lives. So let's say a prayer for this new year. Dear God, we thank you for last year and all the beauty in our lives because of you and because of the people you put in our lives to show us your love. Help us this year to set aside some time to get to know you better and to hear you speak to our hearts and to be following you more closely. We thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. pray with me. God of the prophets and of the present, we pray that your word will not fall on deaf ears, on closed minds, on hardened hearts. May your word shared here today transform our minds and our hearts. May we hear through these words the richness of your love, the depth of your grace, the strength of your call, and your gifts given to fulfill it. Amen. This morning's first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice on the earth. And the coastlands wait for his teachings. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. 
I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and to keep you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prisons, those who sit in darkness. <coughs> I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This morning's second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, from the New Living Translation. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, baptism as Jesus came out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling upon him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. May God add a blessing to the understanding of these words. Amen. for just a moment. Holy One, in these moments, help us to be still and to know that you are God and that you are here present among us. Settle in us all that seems unsettled so that we might truly be able to open ourselves up, our minds, our ears, our hearts, our lives, to the words that you have for each of us today. Amen. So I had an opportunity to um, take some vacation time in between Christmas and the new year, and as I did, I started to read a new book. It's a book called Of Mess and Moxie. Well, not a new book, but a new book to me. Um, it's called A Mess and Moxie, and it's written by Jen Hatmaker, who's a Christian author. And in it, she kind of recounts all of these different aspects of her life, different stories, and the way that her faith has kind of intertwined with them. And uh, in one chapter, she recounts the story of um, chaperoning her young daughter's school trip. So she had promised to be the responsible adult for her daughter and her daughter's friend. And so she dutifully lined her car up behind the bus, ready to go on that morning. And they set off on their way. And they're on their way down the street. And she's thinking, wow, this is taking much longer than I thought it was supposed to. And you know, about an hour and a half later, they land at this place. and. All of these children start to stream off the bus, and she realizes that none of them are hers. <laughs> that she has followed the wrong bus for an extra hour and a half to a place that she didn't know. And now she has to try and find her kid and her kid's friend at this other place. So she calls a mom, and she finally makes her way there. And when she arrives there, her daughter and her daughter's friend are sitting there preparing to have lunch with these pitiful faces on because they are alone. <laughs> And they look at her and they give her this line about the fact that they have felt like orphans all morning long. And Jen's response was, Jesus be a fence. <laughs> Jesus be a fence. Not Jesus be a wall blocking everything and everyone out, or Jesus be a wide open space allowing everything and everyone in, but Jesus be a fence. I found myself saying that a lot this week as I moved in and out of places and situations in this place and at home and around my kids' school. Because, my friends, this past week I have not felt strong enough or equipped enough 
to deal with all of the issues that have arisen. So I found myself saying, Jesus be a fence, a boundary with openings, protecting just enough, and yet giving time to contemplate, right? To determine what we are able to do and how we are able to address issues and who and what we are actually going to let in. So this week, as I wandered around in my own life and uh, outside of this place and in my life here, all of these issues arise, right? Issues with kiddos and behavior and illnesses and issues about surgeries that didn't quite work the way that people had expected or hoped for them to. Loss of loved ones and jobs and people struggling just to make ends meet and put food on their tables to struggles with mental health issues and relationships and physical health issues, people metaphorically ready to burn it all down. And then we look out at the world and there are places that are literally burning down to the ground. And there are earthquakes and missiles and threats and rumors of war and so much more. And so all I could think throughout this last week and all I could pray was Jesus be offense because I am not strong enough. And so as I came to prepare for this preaching moment, I relied on the sage of advice, uh, advice of a great colleague of mine who just happens to be sitting right over here this morning, <laughs> who one day when I was complaining about not knowing what to say in church on a Sunday morning said to me, Jen, preach what you need and perhaps it will fall on the hearts or the mind or the lives of someone else who's in this room on any given Sunday. And so I thought about what I needed. Do I need answers? Do I need solutions? Do I need superpowers to make it all happen, right? To take all of those things and to put them into place and to put them into action. And then I thought, what would I do with any of those things? <laughs> What would I, as one person, and living this life between Naugatuck and Brookfield, Connecticut, what would I do with all of the answers and all of the solutions and the superpowers? And so I went back to the drawing board and I thought again, and I realized that what I need is hope. So if you look in Webster's Dictionary, the definition of hope that you get is this. The feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. But if you read in a Bible dictionary and you look up the definition for hope, it says this. Hope is the expectation of a favorable future under God's direction. Hope is the expectation of a favorable future under God's direction. And so we read about the faithful people throughout history who in hope are full of confidence and trust that something good and blessed and of God will come even in the bleakest and darkest of times. And as I read and reread these scriptures this week and I thought about them, I listened for words of hope. And hope came through the words of the disciple of the prophet Isaiah writing in the in-between time of the Israelites' exile and their return to Jerusalem, I heard words of hope as God promised that God's way would be done, that God and God's servants will not be faint or be crushed, and that God's will and justice will be established on the earth, and that God won't rest until that happens. <coughs> And I heard words of hope as the Spirit was promised. Working its power in both of these scriptures, we hear about the Spirit given to the servant to bring forth justice to the nations and given to all of the people who walk in God's name, even us. And then we read about the Spirit that alights on Jesus in his baptism. Now, oftentimes when we read the story of Jesus' baptism, we, foc we focus on one of two things. We either focus on John and the fact that John doesn't feel like he's strong enough or capable enough or equipped enough to be the one to baptize Jesus. And then we see this kind of turning in John's life as he claims his power and his place in the midst of Jesus' story. And that's a great thing to focus on, right? The ability to take on your call and your mantle and to fulfill it. 
Or we focus on those beautiful words that we hear as Jesus comes up out of the water and the sky opens and God's voice is heard and God says, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Or as Richard read this morning, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. And that's a wonderful thing to focus on too. But as I read the story again this past week, all I could think of was the spirit, right? That spirit that comes down, that spirit that as Jesus comes out of the water, the skies open and alights on him like a dove. And he takes his next steps into his public ministry. Now the spirit, that supporting role that oftentimes doesn't get enough credit or at least enough conversation, we oftentimes think of the Holy Spirit um, and we think about God and Jesus and that other guy or that other thing. Right? We don't often talk about the Holy Spirit all that much. But just like in the movies, think the Golden Globes that just happened this past weekend, right? the spirit plays this really, really important supporting role. Right? The supporting role always helps the main actor to look like his or her best and to do his or her best and makes their success possible in some ways. And the Holy Spirit does that for God's people too, not just on the movie screen, but in our real, everyday lived lives. So the Spirit gives us courage to face issues and guidance to follow God's direction and awareness of gifts and skills that we have and strength to actually do things and not just think about the things that we should do. An opening of the floodgates when all we need is a really good cleansing cry. And the Spirit offers us creativity and inspiration as well. When the Spirit moves, my friends, things happen. And so as I became overwhelmed in this past week, I looked for the spirit at work. I tried to attune myself to the spirit a bit better and to seek out the Easter eggs that the spirit was leaving me throughout the week. And so those things came. They came in the form of an email from Jillian Beswick who said, this is the TED Talk I wanna talk about this coming Monday about optimism and realism and hope. So spoiler alert for any of you who are coming to Monday morning, Monday's studies tomorrow, that's what we're gonna talk about. And I had this conversation with Bryn and completely unprompted, we ended up talking about hope and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then as I moved throughout my week I was opened, opening all of these different emails, and these different emails were about hope and the power that hope and the spirit plays in bringing about a brighter future. Right. And then I turned and I opened up another email, and it was from the United Church of Christ, our wider denominational body, and it was talking about our church's wider mission that money that we pay every year out of our church and society budget that goes out to the wider denomination and that they have already deployed hundreds of thousands of dollars to places like Australia and Puerto Rico for help in the aftermath in the cleaning up and the rebuilding of all that needs to be done. I Watch the spirit move as I wept with someone who shared really difficult news and as I watched a family put itself back together after a very serious loss. My most fervent prayer recently has been for creativity and inspiration. I've been praying for creativity and inspiration in the ways that God is wanting me and us to face the challenges of this time. For we are living in a complicated time, there's no question about that. Ecologically and economically complicated, politically and socially complicated, spiritually and personally complicated. And so I invite the spirit to open our ears up to the needs and the cries of those in our community. To point out places and organizations where we might become partners in our community and beyond. To think about the projects that we might embark on that might actually work to bring about God's vision of what a bright and hopeful future might be. In this new year, the challenge that I have laid out for myself is to allow Jesus to be my fence when I don't feel strong enough to deal with it all and to trust 
to have that real Old Testament kind of confidence that God's way will be done with the help of the most important supporting role of all time, the Holy Spirit. To hope beyond all hope that something good and blessed and something of God can come out in these bleak moments. In Isaiah, it says that God's spirit is upon God's servant and upon all those who walk in God's name and way, that justice will be established in the earth, that those who follow God are called to open the eyes that are blind and to release those who are imprisoned literally and by whatever it is that binds them. God says that the former things have come to pass and that new things are happening. And through the power of the Spirit, we are called to be part of those new things. Whether we know what they are now or whether they are yet to be opened up to us. The hope that they spoke of in the Old Testament in the time of Isaiah and his followers was rooted in the idea that neither weapons of war nor wealth nor idols could provide lasting security. That only God could do that. And so the people were called to follow in this new way, God's way, a way of love and of peacemaking, of doing the right thing, not just for ourselves, but for others and for the world as well. And so we are called to follow that new way for this time, this new time, this time that cries out urgently for change, with lives that are crying out urgently for change, both on a very private and personal scale and on a global one. Our hope rests in our God, who claims us, not only Jesus, but also us as beloved, and finds joy in our justice-seeking and kingdom-building work individually and as a community. And so we are challenged in this time to seek direction from and put our trust in the spirit that animates and emboldens, that encourages and guides, that will help us to do the next right Thanks be to God for this good news, this challenge, and this call. Amen. <coughs> Friends, will you join with me now in our preparation for prayer? list for reason of concern. Um, as we think about our list of concerns, people who are closest to us, um, we are continuing our prayers for those who are grieving, um, especially John and Bryn Smallwood Garcia, grieving not only the loss of John's sister Mona on New Year's Day, but also um, one of Bryn's um, mentors in youth ministry and ministry period, um, Margie Coates, who died at the end of December. Um, and so it is good and it is a blessing that John and Bryn are actually out in California as Bryn is away for some study leave and as they have an opportunity to spend some time with friends and with family out there um, grieving together. Um, we are praying for all of those recovering from recent surgeries, accidents, illnesses, or health challenges. Um, as, 
as uh, I listen to people coughing and sneezing and whatever else, I'm thinking um, at the end when we pass the piece, you may want to do like one of these or a little <laughs> elbow bump or, or something. Um, this has been quite the season uh, between the flu and other viruses that are just kind of hanging on for people. And so we are praying um, especially for um, Janine Hanowitz, who has had something for about the last three weeks, and Cole Crandall, who's um, been in and out of the ER over this past week. Um, and I would invite your prayers for Tony, who feels like she's coming down with something, and I can't let her get sick. So, <laughs> um, prayers for those who are struggling with uncertainties in their lives, and for all of those who are caregivers. And um, we have a number of people who are caregiving, either for um, young children who are um, experiencing some issues at this time, or uh, adult children, or um, parents who are aging. And so we pray strength for all of our caregivers who are out there. Um, and we continue to pray for those who are battling cancer, um, especially Alex, Autumn, Logan, Candace, Evan, Judy, Leanne, Nick, and Sherry, Sabrina, Sina, Stephanie, Tommy, and Vicki. Um, as we look out at our world, I mentioned in my sermon um, many of the issues that um, are being faced out in the world between um, natural disasters and fires and earthquakes and um, wars and rumors of wars and all of these things. Um, I did have someone lift up specific prayers for a few fathers in their children's school who have been deployed. Um, and so prayers for them and for their teachers as they try to support um, those families as well. Um, and prayers for our United Methodist Church, who are in the, our sister church, uh, the United Methodist Church, who's in the middle of some discernment at this time um, in the future of their denomination. We do have some joys to lift up today. Uh, it was great to have Ruth Allen back in church with us this morning. Um, we've been praying for Ruth for a while. She had a hip replacement surgery and then ended up with a fractured femur and so needed to have that uh, fixed as well. Um, so she's been not with us for about the last two and a half months and so she was back um, and was so grateful for the ways that all of you reached out to her uh, with prayers and cards and um, visits and so thank you for that. Um, and uh, prayers for Donna King, prayers of joy. Uh, Donna wrote to us and said that she was able to celebrate the end of her chemotherapy treatments. Um, her port was removed and uh, now she's on a prescription regimen that she hopes will work well um, in the days ahead as she uh, recovers from breast cancer. Um, and prayers for, of joy for Emma Mangold. Um, I was so excited when John wandered into my office this week and said um, that not only has Emma been back uh, on the volleyball court playing, um, but also that she has college plans now for uh, the fall as well, um, which is really, really wonderful considering that um, last spring, Emma couldn't even sit up for an extended period of time um, dealing with a rare autoimmune disorder. Um, and so thank you again for your prayers for Emma um, and for her healing. Um, it's been a blessing to be able to celebrate along with her and the new tools that she's learned as well. Um, and I know that you all have thoughts, prayers, people, situations on your hearts and in your minds. So for whom else shall we be in prayer, friends? Yeah, Amy. For For Prabal and the Ghosh family as well. For Billy, as he awaits some very serious medical test results. Yeah, Kathy. Prayers for Denise and Cheryl today. Yeah. Prayers for Peter. Yeah. Why is it singing a mantra? We we oftentimes I mean we very much appreciate you choir when you are up here and you are singing kind of in this direction. But when you are out here amongst people, like all of a sudden, I even hear it. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Our church can sing. <laughs> so other names or thoughts or prayers? Yeah. For John, Bobby, and Barbara. Prayers for John and Bobby and Barbara. Yeah. Um, just a, a joy to um, recognize Natalie for. You got tears. Being a rock star. <laughs> for being a rock star, Maddie. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> You're like, I think that's what she was praying about. <laughs> that's a proud mama right there, Maddie. <laughs> So, Maddie, we surround you in prayers as you go through your medical school preparations as well and interviews. Yeah. 
a living. Prayers for Patsy, of course. Yeah, Sue? Uh, I just want to say the joy of having you as our pastor. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sue. <laughs> Other names or situations to lift up? Yeah, Maurice. Mary, Sue, and Pam. Prayers for Mary and Sue and Pam today. Other <coughs> names to lift up? So um, I prayed along uh, with some others about um, grieving my parents' travels down to Florida, but um, I do... Uh, wish to celebrate along with you all my dad's birthday, but he got to celebrate his January birthday in Florida in his shorts and his t-shirt with a big smile on his face. And so um, so that was really a joy uh, for him to be able to celebrate. So, um, so thank you for your support and your care. <laughs> but, uh, but it really is a blessing for them to be away for a while. Any other names to be lifted up? Then, friends, let us join our hearts and our souls in the spirit of prayer. And I share with you today the words of a gentleman from the Church of Scotland, actually. His name is Tom Gordon. And so let us pray. God, in a world where many would seek to do damage to your creation, bring hatred to your people, show violence to your children, help us always to be grateful for the gifts of love and light, for the glimpses of transforming beauty and unending wonder. Take us now and use us well to combat evil and destruction wherever we find it. God, in a world driven by greed and a lust for power where the material threatens to overwhelm the spiritual, where goodness seems too frail in the face of badness, help us not to give up on righteousness and truth, but to believe that you can use well the gifts we offer, that you will call forth the gifts of your people again and again. God, in a world where people are broken at the hands of humanity, and by the vagaries of nature, help us to trust the healing of your blessing and love, placed even now in the hands of those who seek to face down injustice and walk the journey with those who struggle, who stand in the dark places with your light held high, who give of themselves for the sake of others. God, in a world where we struggle to understand pain and suffering, most especially in the lives of those who we love, we bring before you those for whom we weep this day, those we embrace in our hearts. And we pray your healing and your strength and your peace and your guidance and your direction to be in their lives. And God, in a world where all the news seems to be bad, help us to see the places where your light breaks in and brings joy, where we are able to celebrate one with another ministries in this place, reaching out in care, where we are able to celebrate birthdays and new steps along life journeys and recoveries. And God, in a world where we can feel so insignificant and helpless, help us to know your hope and to see your spirit at work guiding and directing us to the place you have for us in your vision. Lift our spirits when we don't feel good or strong enough. Fit us into your plan in amazing ways as we strive to serve you. We pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our guide and our example. Amen. And so, friends, we are blessed today to have an opportunity to hear from Susan Dodd. Good morning. I've been a member of this church for over 30 years, uh, but it took close to the first 20 to get me involved much past um, beyond attending services and choir. I was somehow afraid that to know too much about the inner workings of the church might somehow detract from my spiritual journey. Whoa, was I wrong. It has been just the opposite. The more I participate, the deeper my faith grows. We've already seen that giving makes a world of difference. It feels great to help other people. Giving changes them, and then it changes us as we gain a sense of purpose. And with purpose comes greater happiness, interest in personal growth, avoidance of depression, and maybe even improved health, if your stewardship gets you up and off the couch. And social science backs this up. Research shows that money is a leading cause of stress. Well, duh. But you know what? It also shows that giving is a leading cause of happiness. A paradox to be sure, but that's because giving changes us. Giving changes everything. 
I've learned that financial stewardship is more than just auto renewal. It involves introspection, consideration, understanding, growth, prayer. Now the church is happy to receive donations regardless, but it prefers gifts that are given with a joyful heart because congregant faith journeys, our faith journeys, are one of the core missions of our faith. And when we give with a joyful heart, money begins to lose its hold over our lives and becomes the tool that God intended. Giving to CCB gets great return on investment. The payback, a community within which we are a valued and engaged member, a community to which we can turn when we need help or support, all while knowing that we make the world a better place. Generation, generosity is a small price to pay for all that. Now last Sunday, our congregation voted to approve an austere proposed budget that reflects a 15% increase. And if you missed last week, all the unavoidable reasons are outlined in our recent crossways. And this week, our annual stewardship campaign begins. But the stewardship committee is not raising these funds. We're here to remind you that one, the congregation is charged with meeting this budget, and two, why it's important to do so, which is what I've been talking about so far this morning. We all know what stewardship means to this church. We've seen how CCB makes a difference from the other side of the world to right here inside our own hearts. Pledging is your opportunity to demonstrate two things, gratitude for all you receive and support of all that CCB does. This year, as you prayerfully consider your donation to the church to help bridge this 15% gap, include your interfaith journey and your pledge in your prayers and watch the dividends flow. This morning's offering will now be received.
join me in our offertory prayer. Holy God, by the power of your spirit, bless and multiply these gifts. Use them to bring about new things in our community, our nation, and our world, things drenched with your power and a sense of hope. Through our gifts and service inspired by you, let all who are in need experience the presence and power of your spirit active on their behalf and in their lives. Amen. shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with loving kindness and grant you peace. And may God watch between and among us until we meet again. Amen.
friends, blessed by the peace of Christ, let us share a sign of that peace with one another and bring those signs and actions of peace out into the world. The peace of Christ be with you all. Thank you.